Well, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, I've been listening carefully to the speeches on both sides of this debate, and I had the unworthy suspicion that some of the speeches from this side of the debate were plants from the other side of the debate. I, I, I was struck, in particular, by the young man who, who told us that, well, he was here speaking for Scottish independence because it would make England richer. Get rid of these uh, impoverished Scots and make England richer. Now, of course, he was uh, in jest, at least I think he was. <laughs> but there's a point here. What I can't understand, just in terms of logic, not as a, a politician, what I can't understand, if the people who pronounce this argument that somehow the impoverished Scots are subsidised by the munificence of the London Treasury, then why isn't his argument more current among unionist politicians at Westminster? Why are they so absolutely determined to hang on to Scotland at all costs if they really believed it would be a massive boost to England to get shot of the Scots? So, yes, of course. Yes, I did. Indeed, I do. I just haven't heard any positive arguments for the union tonight. What I've heard instead is that how Scotland is somehow not a, a real nation. I mean, let's forget the thousand years of Scottish history as an independent nation uh, before the Treaty of Union. Let's forget that Scotland, uh, along with Wales, is one of the most distinctive national entities in Europe. It's had a geographical integrity for the last 700 years or so. Somehow, it's a subject that would be worthy of partition. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that partition hasn't worked particularly well in these islands in the recent past, and it would be foolish to try and apply it to Scotland? Well, no, no, what you said was somehow Scotland as a nation didn't have the right of self-determination because it wasn't a real nation. Well, let me tell this august assembly, if Scotland's not a real nation, then there's hardly a real nation on earth that has every characteristic as a bona fide nation, no better than any other nation, but entitled to the rights of any, no thank you, entitled to the rights of any other nation. Now, Finlay uh, proposing, and what a fine maiden speech it was to you, uh, bedecked in the black watch tartan, Finlay. Uh, as I remember, a, a regiment formed to put down a colonial insurrection in Egypt, if I recall correctly, and you were very kind to us. There was no uh, ducks out uh, uh, tonight, and well done on your, your maiden speech. But I like Cole Hamilton. You started with a, a fine tribute to, to Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, and then you went on to suggest that somehow Nicola Sturgeon was in a continuum with Donald Trump. Now let me stand here at the Oxford Union and defend Nicola Sturgeon. <laughs> Whatever differences we have had, Nicola Sturgeon is not in a politician on a continuum with Donald Trump. In fact, I've actually beaten Donald Trump in court three times uh, as he tried to uh, get a... Uh, when demonstrator moved from me, yes, of course. <laughs> well, perhaps the difference is that every time I've been in court, I've won. So that's uh, here, here. Uh, something perhaps this uh, fair-minded body would, uh, would uh, call into uh, account. But I Cole Hamilton made this, this argument that, that somehow those who support Scottish independence uh, are Johnny come lately to the cause of Europe. Now, okay, the SNP adopted the Scotland and Europe cause about 1995, which is a fair time ago, and have consistently pursued it, as has the other aspects, and Alapa argues for EFTA and for rejoining the single market. They look at Scottish independence within a, a European context. What Alec Cole Hamilton failed to tell us is that the Liberal Democrats one of the few consistent themes of that party over the last 50 years has been its pro-European agenda. But what is the policy of the Liberal Democrats today? Is it to rejoin the European Union at the earliest opportunity to get back into that magnificent union across the continent? No. 
That is not what they're any longer arguing for. So it ill behoves Alec Cole Hamilton to tell us that somehow the, those who argue for Scottish independence are Johnny come lately to the European cause when they have deserted it precisely at the moment when a poll shows that 58% of the UK population are now in favour of rejoining. Yes, of course. We've heard earlier about how he's actually been successful in monetizing that disinformation on a certain state backed media channel. She, but in action, I think people that listen to my remarks will know that if you cut me, I believe you. I am a European to my fingertips, as are my mind. Well, Is this a point of information to the speaker? We <laughs> want to see the United Kingdom walking in step with our European neighbours. We have to. Please may the honourable member make a question to the speaker if I, if or I may say, resume a seat. I will finish with this. <laughs> I feel that considering that the ad hominem. Can I have an intervention on your intervention? <laughs> uh, not immediate rejoining. So, the bit that said not immediately rejoining, that's the bit that tells us the Liberal Democrats are no longer advocating rejoining the European Union. How like a Liberal Democrat? For the first time in recent political history, they've got majority opinion on their side, and they choose that moment to desert the European <laughs> cause. And as for these barbed remarks about a programme, uh, that was broadcast in RT, an editorially independent. I well remember the last program. It was the day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine before I withdrew the program. And I remember that interview in particular. I was interviewing Sir Vince Cable, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats. And let me suggest to you <laughs> that Vince Cable, who I believe is a considerable politician, perhaps even more considerable than Alec Cole Hamilton, would not have appeared on a propaganda outlet as described. Now, I want to make, as we have done from this side, the positive case. I believe that it is true, the world over, that nobody runs a country better than the people of that country themselves. I think self-determination, independence, is the natural state of countries. Alec Cole Hamilton tried to suggest it was something which was old hat, that was something that uh, doesn't exist. Well, when the United Nations was formed in 1945, it had almost 50 members. It now has almost 200 members. The tide of history over that time has gone in favor of self-determination, in favor of independence. Uh, and today, I actually thought I would get through an Oxford Union debate without hearing the word empire. <laughs> but I've actually heard from one of the uh, proponents of, uh, against the resolution tonight that uh, the British Empire was something we should be celebrating. I think the Oxford Union is moved beyond the imperial phase. And it's time for this union to embrace the idea that countries across the world have embraced the idea of self-determination and independence. I give way. Oh, I missed a bit about the uh, uncountable evils, but let me tell you this. Uh, there's, I think there's 50 countries that have become independent from uh, London since the Second World War. And in my time as, uh, in politics and public life, I think I met the high commissioners for every single one of these countries. Rich and small, big, poor, prosperous, a whole variety of countries. And you know what the one thing they had in common? Not one single one of them said, we're going to come back under Westminster rule. Not one single one of them. Now, why is it? That, and the young lady, incidentally, no thank you. The young lady, incidentally, who said that she was looking to articulate the case, I thought it actually articulated it superbly. When she said, what are the unionist forces frightened of to deny Scotland its right of self-determination? And self-determination is not a static thing. If a result of one election determined everything, then the Liberal Democrats would never hope to get back to the glories of Lloyd George. They want to have another go at another election. That's what self-determination is like. 
People are entitled at each election to make new choices. The referendum on Scottish independence was in 2014. Uh, people who were, who were eight years old would get to vote in a new referendum in uh, Scotland on self-determination. It's a continuum, it's not a static thing. There are two major events through my uh, political lifetime that tell you why devolution is not enough. Firstly, that was the war in Iraq, where <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people died, billions exerted in treasure and money and wastage of resources, and a tragedy which genuinely upset the international order of affairs across and undermined the United Nations. That was uh, something that Scotland, in the devolution age, could do nothing to stop because it was determined at Westminster. The second was in the last time I spoke in this uh, Oxford Union was the Brexit debate. As Mr. Simon Sheikh had told us, 62% of Scotland voted to be part of the European Union, to stay in that union. And the costs and the consequences of that are felt in this country of England as well as the country of Scotland. But how would the people of this union, the people of this country feel if they were suffering these consequences against the votes that they had cast at the ballot box. When Finlay proposed the resolution, he talked about the problems of the health service in Scotland, and he was looking for some sort of reason why these problems were connected with this debate tonight. One of the biggest problems in the health service is the inability to discharge people from hospitals into care homes. What's the key problem in care homes? It's shortage of staff. What is the key reason for that shortage of staff? is we're no longer in the single market. We no longer have the available staff who've been so valuable in our health service and care service over the last generation. And that's why it matters to be able to control your own affairs and to make sure that you make a contribution to the world. We on this side of the house have nothing negative to say about the opponents of the proposition. This is about Scotland's potential as a nation. The ability that has been demonstrated the world over time and time again to take control of your own resources, use the skills and ingenuity of your people to make a better future. I'll never accept the idea that Scotland is better than any other nation, but equally I'll never accept the idea that we're any worse. Let's take responsibility for our own affairs, full responsibility to run our country better and to make our own distinctive contribution to the world. Thank you.